It's Monday, that means it's Setup Monday. Let's talk charts, let's talk supply, demand, production, consumer, long, short, seasonality. We'll start there. So I beat this drum of seasonality, right? And I don't really care if other people believe it or not. But when you look at the numbers, it's really simple. January, June, September are terrible months for Bitcoin as far as historically what has happened. Wake me up when September ends is a meme that I've created over the years because September is the worst month for returns historically. Q1 historically is the worst quarter other than Q3 for returns, whereas Q2, Q4 for BTC specifically, obviously Q4 you can see is an overperformer here, definitely, relative to the others. So for me it's important going into the seasonality, the almanac, I open it up, I say, okay, where are we? We're January, January historically is flat or negative, there isn't a lot to trade here. Now you could be more active or hyperactive and move into alts or DeFi or be hedged, be straddled, whatever, what have you. Or you can just sit back and let it ride flat, as it were. You know, cash, that's appropriate as well, I think, here. Just to sit out all of the chop volatility. I mean, to actively be trading BTC right now is a lesson in masochism, I believe. Now let's talk about let's talk about GBTC, let's talk about CME. These are the two biggest players that we can look at that is actual supply demand, actual buying. This isn't fake. This is a hundred percent legitimate. And you can say GBTC is a terrible example of Bitcoin, the premium is whatever. This shouldn't exist. That doesn't matter, right? This is apolitical, it is agnostic of everything. It is just a measure of what's going on in the institution as far as money flow, right, for me. So to see GBTC volume rising, great, I'm bullish, right? In generally, if volumes are up in crypto, that's bullish. If it's in the conversation, that's bullish. If people have access, that's bullish. That's why we talk about Cash App, we talk about Robinhood, we talk about all this stuff. Some of it's custodial, some of it's non-custodial, some of it doesn't represent actual Bitcoin. I don't, none of that matters to me, okay? All that matters is access, volume, is it in the conversation? Are people aware? Because when the time comes for decentralization, when the call is brought forth, people will then know where to go and what to do as they're experiencing here with problems with Robinhood and sort of overflow into crypto type stuff, DeFi and or DEXs, centralized exchanges in crypto, all that sort of stuff. Custody, custody of your own things. So bullish on volume. And if we look at some of this data from crypto, crypto quant, it's pretty clear. Bitcoin reserves here in the red, price in the black. Uh, this is exchange reserves. So as exchange reserves fall, price goes up. No brainer, supply demand. I don't think there's a simpler exemplification of this. As exchange reserve declines, there's less float. It's put into custody, it's put into institutional whatever, and it's just squirreled away, right? It's it's out of the system. Now, if this starts to reverse, we can be bearish, right? I can look at all this chop, and I can look at the exchange reserves, and I can say, okay, here's, here's this side of the pro-con for bull bear, right? I can't be super bearish if exchange reserves are still down or flat, despite price being flat. I can't be mega bearish when minor outflows are as high as they are, maybe the highest ever notionally, and price doesn't seem to be going down. You know, logically, if there wasn't notional value, notional volume to absorb the selling, price should go down. That's just in my own head where I'm thinking. So there's some miner that's saying he's got it would take him 50 years to sell all the BTCs that he has, right? Like, I don't care because I see what's happening here. Let him sell it. Let him try to bring the price down. Like, doesn't matter to me. Until it happens, then we'll react accordingly. But seeing minor outflows, basically at all-time highs, notional, I'm pretty sure, and or close to all-time highs, and price 
essentially remaining flat or sideways is incredibly bullish to me because that says all this is being absorbed by things like GBTC where buying just continues. And we can talk about the premium on GBTC. We can say, is the premium negative or positive? Is that bad or good? Is that an indication of people buying or selling? Is that an indication of demand and of product? Now that's, that's a specific conversation for someone with knowledge of that specific thing. But I think ultimately, if GBTC matured into an ETF, that would be the best case for everybody. Um, it's probably more likely to happen if premium is flat or zero. You can also look at things like the CME net positions. And this is called a COT report, commitment of traders. And they break this down into types of trader. For me, seeing leveraged money increasingly short tells me that this is this these are likely people who are long spot or in options or doing something else somewhere in the market. They're not just net short, most likely. So to me, to see shorts rising is actually bullish because that says they're neutral in other ways. Maybe that's a misread, but I like lever I like the leveraged shorts where they are. And I think if this comes way down. To me, that's more bearish than bullish, actually, because that says people are just opting out of crypto entirely, like the mega money people, right? These The sizes of these positions are incredibly large relative to any spot retail position. Uh, yes, they're cash, but that's kind of irrelevant because it it's just a barometer for, for me, again, institutional money inflow. Let's talk about some TA stuff. So we're in Q1, right? We're in January. Well, actually, we're in February now, but we were in January. January was flat or down, whatever. It doesn't matter. Still in Q1. We opened at what, like 29K uh, for the year? TA is telling me one of two things. If we go up, it's 46. If we go down, it's 28. That's not an if. If we go down or up sort of thing. It's an if this, then that. Uh, so um, really what I'm watching is this four-hour cloud. If we are able to move above the four-hour cloud again, you know, this, you can say this was Elon, you can say this was derivative options, CME options, you can say it's just generally rollover shenanigans, whatever. It doesn't matter to me. Again, I don't care what the, the narrative is. I'm just here to trade, right? But if we can get a bullish Kumo breakout on the four-hour, to me, that's the bad signal to go long. You can see the cloud is flat. TK is going to be flattish again. Um, overall, I want everything to be bullish again. I don't want a spike. I want this slow grind up. Very easy type of entry. Probably going to be around 34 to 35k. So let this chop around in exactly the, the place the cloud tells you you shouldn't be trading. Right? The cloud tells you this dynamic support resistance, and between that is anybody's guess which is generally why you avoid trading there altogether. With the exception of trades like this, where these are called edge-to-edge -edge trades, where if we break this support, we likely reach for this support. So if we break 31 to 33 over the next couple of weeks, I do expect a, a tap of 28. Now, my read on this is if we break the 4-hour cloud, I'm expecting a tap of basically new all-time highs. You know, you can look at previous local highs for resistance, right? But really, to me, if we break this yearly pivot, we're going to climb it like a ladder to 46. Another example of fire of lack of trend here is alligator fractals. So this is just three EMAs, and these fractals are based on candlesticks. So low, high, low is a, I call it a bull, fra bull fractal. High, low, high is a bear fractal. So those give you entries on the way up, as well as stop losses. They give you entries on the way down as well as stop losses. So right now in the EMAs, that's the first, similar to the cloud, you, know, you want, that's the first part of the checklist. So the EMAs are just flat, jumbled. It's unclear, right? This is very obvious where you should be on that side of the trade. Long, short, right? When you're inside the EMAs and the EMAs are inside themselves, there's, again, no trade zone. So if this were to clean itself up over the next couple of days or week, that is another long entry signal. Right now, this is telling you basically to go long at 40 if the EMAs are bullish. So I expect this to just chop around for another couple of days at minimum. And then we'll have some more fractal entries. Ideally, you know, you don't want to wait to 40, in my opinion, to long this. 
but this just needs needs more time. And then lastly, on the BTC side of things, I'm perpetually watching this. Pitch fork, you pick three points, gives you a rate of change, gives you a time component, gives you support resist levels. If this uh, support does not hold similar similar to that cloud edge to edge trade, I'd, I'd expect a tap of the median line here, a tap of the pit, uh, pivot potentially, a tap of the 200 day moving average potentially. So that's, you know, that's 20K. I don't, again, the price is the price, right? I don't care what that is. I'm just here to trade, okay? So <laughs> that might sound insane, you know, of whatever percentage move that is down, doesn't matter to me. And you can think the same on the way up. Just view all of this as resistance along with the yearly pivots. But where this sits in the pitchfork, I don't think there's a massive concern for a median line touch. It's just if we get there, if this, then that, right? Part of the decision tree. Switching gears to ETH, talking about all the same stuff, right? Supply demand, GBTC, ETH, uh, we have a CME futures contract starting February 8th. I think all of this is going to play a big role in, I think most people do, in uh, volatility for ETH upcoming. Now, if I were the, the institutional cabal, I would try to run ETH up as high as I physically can before the open of the futures and then just short the ever-living crap out of it when it opens. Okay, we'll see if that actually happens, if that thesis comes true. But if we're looking at exchange reserves, again, exchange reserves falling, falling, falling. This is crypto quant data again. Falling, 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 right? This is multi-month lows. Price is flat sideways. To me, there's a divergence here. It's, it's massively bullish. As exchange reserves fall, price should continue to rise. We haven't seen a reaction to this yet, so it's a bit of a lagging indicator at the moment and or divergence. So I'm bullish ETH for that reason. Grayscale also reopened its private placement of... ETH shares last week, another reason to be bullish, January 29th, uh, on ETH. Again, just supply demand, right? Total value staked on the 2.0 contract continues to steadily increase, approaching 3 million ETH. In the grand scheme of things, that's nothing, but at some point it hits a tipping scale, right? And all of a sudden, there's just not enough ETH for sale, or there's not enough people selling ETH, whatever you want to think of that as. And if we look at the grayscale holdings, again, actually declined a little bit, it looks like, since uh, they were closed. But I expect this to start increasing again very shortly. Should be massively bullish for ETH. Looking at some technicals, I am zeroed in on this amazing looking pattern to me because ETH has been so quiet, so non-volatile, so flat over the past 30 days, right? It, it, this is the entire month of January. It had its run up and then it just went flat. You're getting a series of higher lows to equal highs. To me, that's a clear-cut case for a an ascending triangle. You're getting a descending volume profile, which to me is a big tip-off of this is obviously consolidation. Waiting for things to explode here. I'm bullishly biased. ETH here, a net long ETH here. This is a breakout trade above 1430 for a leverage long for me here. So this is a massive, massive watch. Be at your battle stations. Get ready for this. It's certainly at the low end of the extremes to consider this a an ascending triangle at this point, but I'm still uh, optimistic and hopeful because of all the other stuff I just talked about with supply demand, with ETH and uh, ETHE and CME stuff coming. Now, if we look at a trend indicator like the cloud, it's been completely nonsensical, right? It told you to go long, it stopped you out over and over and over again. So another indication that this is just consolidation before a bigger move. And you can certainly watch this for an entry, you know, on this chart pattern, but I'd much rather just watch the horizontal, right? It's just obvious. It's a line. You can go long above 14 and you're good to go. If we switch gears to the 12-hour cloud, 12-hour cloud has actually been really great at the trend since November. So it told you to go long in November and it's told you to add, 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 add. It might tell you to add again, uh, but the entire time it stayed above the cloud, above both the TK lines. So again, another way to tell you long is the way. Here's the daily cloud. A little bit more of a mess, but essentially says the same thing. You know, it's told you to go long in November 
and it's tapped the TK lines over and over and over again. There is a bit of a TK C clamp, TK disequilibrium here with a Kijun at 1K. So to me, that's the floor at this point for any further bullish continuation. We can go to 1K and still be fine for upside. And then going into Q2, there's this edge to edge thing that's growing, but this, the size of the cloud looks good. The spread of the TK lines looks fine. Even this, to me, isn't that much of a concern on the daily for ETH because this has looked a lot worse. So it's, it's hard to be bearish on ETH from that respect. If we look at the pitchfork, this is the most concerning thing for me because we're at the extreme of the pitchfork. So logic tells me, don't be long up here. Consider short. Consider being in cash. This wants to mean revert to the median line. That's what this tells me. So can it break through two yearly pivots? I don't know. You know, 950 and 1250 looks like where the yearly pivots are. To the downside, to the upside, it's 16, it's 20, or 2000, 1600 and 2000. So I still like up, I like 16 to 2000, right? 1600 to 2000. The if this, then that decision tree tells me, if not, you know, we're going to, we're going to some low targets, um, 700, 500, 600, something in there, based on that indicator. And then lastly, I just want to talk about ETH BTC. I don't trade ETH BTC because, because for me, it's just too volatile. I generally can't really make sense of it. Uh, trend indicators are favorable. This is the two day chart, just to give you an idea of how much I have to zoom out to even see something as far as a discernible signal. Two day chart. I like 05 as a target based on BPVR, based on yearly pivot, based on psychological resistance. Uh, there's more, you know, support resist levels at basically current price for ETH PTC based on yearly pivot, based on v VPVR, tons of support at 03 based on VPVR. So I don't think this goes low, low anytime soon. Uh, I just don't think for me, there's a trade here. Um, but ultimately, if we move back to seasonality, Q1 historically has been the quarter for ETH PTC to do anything. So it's got a couple more months to do something, you know, 60 more days essentially. And after that, it's for me a big fat ignore because historically it's done a bunch of nothing. So that's all I have for this one. Let me know what you think in the comments below and happy trading.